Statistics, binomial experiment, proportion of customer complaints, remedied, example, problem. Get ready and some coffee because it's time to get realistic with statistics. You're not re First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're currently in the OneNote presentation section, 1950 binomial experiment, proportion of customer complaints remedied tab. Looking at a situation similar to recent example problems, except this time we have a binomial experiment, which means two, and we're gonna have a situation where it's not a 50-50 breakout, which makes it a little bit more difficult for us to set up than prior examples using a binomial type of experiment. Our general scenario being similar, however, in that we're trying to find information about a large population. We can't test every item within that population, it's just too big. Therefore, what we're going to do, we're going to take a sample from that large population, test the sample, hoping that we can apply the findings found from the sample to the characteristics of the larger population. You will recall there are two major forms or types of ways that we might do this, one being hypothesis testing, two being confidence intervals. Hypothesis testing lending itself to situations where we know what the middle point is, or at least think we know and want to test whether or not that is the case, such as if it says there's so many peanuts in a bag of peanuts, we could say that's going to be our middle point. We can imagine making a graph around that middle point and then sampling, seeing whether or not the results we get from the sample are far enough away for us to reject the original null hypothesis. Then we have confidence intervals, which lends itself to situations where we don't know what the middle point is. That's what we're trying to find, in which case, when we take the sample, that's usually what we're gonna think of as the middle point, and then we'll use some way, shape, or form to create a confidence level range around that middle point to give us the degrees of confidence. And this time we're looking at a binomial situation, which of course means two. So that means that unlike other situations where the results that we can get from any test could be more than one, for example, if you're testing heights, then the results you're gonna get from the sample could be something like 511, 52, 63, so on and so forth. Whereas with a binomial experiment, you can only get two results, such as we looked at a coin flip situation. Each test could either only be heads or tails. Can't land on the side of the coin. I guess theoretically it could, but in our experiment, no, you can't have three, only two. That's why it's a binomial experiment. This time we're gonna calculate the proportion of customer complaints settled in one week. So this is common uh, in a business scenario where you might have a survey that says, how satisfied are you one to five, one to 10? Multiple results in that one. But if you say, was are you satisfied or were you not satisfied? Then that's a binomial type of survey or in a political situation, if there's only two candidates, binomial situation, or if you were to ask the question, are you gonna vote for this particular candidate or not? Yes or no answer, uh, two, an two possible results on that one. For our situation, we're gonna imagine we have a number of customer complaints that come in, and the question is, has those customer complaints been remedied or have they not? Uh, been remedied. So that's the binomial situation. Either they've been remedied or they have not. Now, a lot of people, we're going to pretend we're like in the movie industry and we're addressing the customer complaints. And a lot of people have old fashioned ideas about how you address customer complaints. Like, you know, the customer's always right. And you're going to try to try to fix and solve the problem and make the customer feel good and whatnot. But that's like, that's like old stuff. That's like, you're, you're like living in the fifties, man. The new Hollywood way that they do that 
is when there's customer complaints, then you attack them with the social medias so that, and so that they crumble and beg for forgiveness. And then when they, and then you, and then they have to publicly swear that they will assign allegiance to whatever movie that we made as the general idea. So, so that's going to be, so that's what we're trying to do. We have the customer complaints on the movies and then how many of those customer complaints have we remedied by crushing their reputations on social media so that they will never dare to, to speak out again and will spend the rest of their lives telling the virtues of our cinema in, out of fear. So that's going to be the idea. So then obviously when we have a binomial experiment, uh, we, we have a similar situation, uh, to, but it's a little bit different because it's binomial. So with a binomial experiment, when we think about the actual data itself, it's not going to have a bell-shaped curve, of course. You're going to have something that looks like this. Now, you will recall that we like to have something that's going to have a bell-shaped curve to it because we know the characteristics of the bell-shaped curve. It's easy for us to determine how much is under the curve at any given point, and we can define it with, in essence, just two numbers, one being the middle point, the average or uh, the mean, the second being the spread, the standard deviation. So you will recall, just like when we have a non-binomial experiment, we could have the data that would be bell-shaped, but we could have non-bell-shaped data, such as it's skewed to the left, it's skewed to the right, or it has a uniform distribution. And so that means that the data itself is not bell-shaped, but if we imagined taking every combination of sample and the average of every combination of samples, then that data would tend towards a bell shape. And we can think of a similar type of situation here, although the average is a little bit easier in some ways, but that's the idea. So then if I go back on over here, we can say that our original uh, data, if we think about these two things, the middle point and the standard deviation, the original data is going to have a middle point, which is going to be the mean or average, which can be approximated by the sample. And we can also imagine it being approximated by the, if we imagined all possible combinations of sample sizes. So, the, so that's always going to be tending towards the same number. It's the standard deviation that could be different, right? So when we were looking at non-binomial experiments, we have this formula the standard deviation, you can have the standard deviation of the population, which sometimes is not known. You could have the standard deviation of the sample that we are taking, which should tend towards the standard deviation of the population, but is not what we're looking for if we're trying to apply the central limit theorem to get a bell-shaped curve. We're looking for the standard deviation of all possible combinations, and that's going to be done not by actually taking all possible combinations, but by using this formula, which if it was not binomial, is the standard deviation of the population if it was known, or the standard deviation of a, of a sample if it was not known, divided by the square root of n, n being the sample size, and then we usually drop off this second bit if big n, the population is fairly large. This time it's a little bit different, so same kind of idea, but the formula is a little different due to the nature of the binomial experiment. So we're just going to take the proportion, which is kind of like the mean, the average of the item that we're looking for, times 1 minus the proportion, which is the other bit that's going to add up to 100%, which will make more sense shortly, divided by n, which is the sample size of the population, the whole square root of all that. We can usually drop off this first bit if big N, the, the population is large enough. Okay, so given that, we're going to say that, that P represents that it's been resolved and 1 minus P says that it's not resolved. So we're looking, we're going to represent this as the percent of the items that were resolved. So if it was 70% resolved, that's what we're going to say, 70% resolved. And that's the part we're going to focus on, which of course means that about 30% not resolved. So 70% of these movie complaints about our latest movie saying it's lame, or whatever we have gone out and we have crushed them till till they till they will till they will not show their face on the socials ever again you better watch you better buy yourself a full-length mirror because you need to watch yourself 
That's why you need to watch yourself. All right. So in any case, now we're going to try to generate this within Excel. Now, the problem with an Excel, I'd like to come up with a situation where we have random number generations, but it's not a 50-50 uh, type of situation. So how can we do that in Excel? So we're going to we're going to imagine that that zero, one, and two are going to represent that we have resolved them. That means our customer complaints department has crushed the opposition that that we've we've uh, ridiculed them to to submission. But there's still like this one that has not been. So all the ones that are threes means that we have not yet we have not yet gotten to them. We haven't been able to hunt them down. We couldn't find their address. You know. Uh, and so whatever the reason, uh, the three rep, so that means that we have the three out of four that we, that we have resolved. So three, three, four should be resolved. So if we look at this, then this is going to be our count. And then we're going to do a random number generation here in Excel. So the way we got the data is we're saying, give me a random number between zero and three. And I'm saying for this purposes, zero, one, and two represent that we have resolved it, and the three represents not. The random numbers are gonna give us an even, somewhat even randomness between numbers zero and three, given this formula. And then we can count them. So now I'm gonna go through and say, I wanna count the ones that have either a zero, one, or a two. So now, Within this column, the data column, I have zeros, ones, twos, and threes, somewhat evenly distributed. But I want it to just rep be represented as zeros, ones, and zeros. So now I'm gonna make this column, which says count. I wanna count this column uh, if it is a zero. And then I say plus, also count it if it's a one, plus also count it if it's a two, so it's going to count it, meaning it's going to return from this cell. If it's a zero, one, or two, it's going to return a one because there's only one thing in there. And if it's a three, then it's not going to count it. And that means it's going to be zero. So it counted this as a one. That's a one. That's a one. That's a one. That's a one. Here's a three. It's a zero. Here's a three. It's a zero. So that's just a little way that you can see we do this in Excel if you want to check that out in more detail, but that's just the way that we got the data, which is now represented in the format that we want over here, which is showing that a one represents P that it's resolved that we have crushed the P on and one minus P shows that it's not been resolved. We have not been able to find them. They, they're, they, we haven't been able to, to get their address and go, go to their home or anything. And it's sad. Uh, and we need to do, we need to do better. We need to we need to do better. Okay, this is unacceptable. The whole Hollywood is going down because of this inefficiency in our in our this this it's this department's fault right here that we can't get it done. So then we have P equals resolved. So if we count these, then we're looking to to count all the ones that now have a one in them. Comes out to one seventy seven. And then if we count all of the ones that have a zero with this formula, it comes out to 73. So the total number here was 250 that we did. I probably didn't save all of them. 250 and 177 are resolved. 73 are not resolved. If we look at that from the standpoint of a percentage, 177 divided by 250, that comes out to 70.8. And then we've got the 73 divided by the 250 that comes out to 0. 0.29, 2, 29.2. We add those together, of course, 70.8 plus 29.2, it comes out to 100%. So obviously we're looking at this from the standpoint of the percent resolved. This is basically the average, right? The average that has been in essence uh, resolved is the general idea. So 70% are the ones resolved, which of course means one minus 70% are the ones that have not yet been resolved. So, but there are, you're on the list. Don't think you're, don't think you're getting away. You better buy yourself a full length mirror. That's what I'm talking about. Cause you need, why? Cause you need to watch yourself. Okay. I'm going to stop with that. So in, in population is going to be 40,000 that we're imagining. All right. And then the sample is 250. 
So that's how many, how many samples that we took of this to test it out. Now these are just tests to see whether or not it's going to tend towards a bell-shaped curve because remember this isn't bell-shaped over here. So we wanna make sure that the central limit theorem is kicking in so we can use the normal distribution. So these are just general tests for that. We take N, which is the sample size, 250 times P, which is, uh, what was P? It was uh, 70, so 0 0.708. And we come out to 177, that's greater than five, so we're good on that one. One minus P, which is the other percent. So now we're gonna take uh, the 250, which is N times, one minus p which is just the 29 the other part uh, of the binomial 0.292 and that comes out to 73. okay and so then we're going to say the expected uh the expected p bar which is going to is going to be this number that's in essence the mean because we have a binomial experiment so we're just picking up that's the perspective we're looking at it from and this is a test to, to see whether or not we need that second bit of the formula, which is this bit, which normally we don't if the population is large enough typically, which is large N. So in this case, we can calculate that out by saying little n, which is the sample size of 250 over big N, which is the population 40,000. And so we should, that's like 0 0.26, 0 0.2625, uh, sorry. And there it is there, so we should be good on that test. So the standard error calculation then, the standard error calculation. Now this, you will recall, is basically the standard deviation that we're looking for. And I just wanna recap on the standard deviation, remembering there's in essence three kind of ideas of the standard deviation. Standard deviation of the population itself, all 40,000, which we may not have, right? standard deviation of the sample which is going to tend towards the standard deviation of the population but it's not binomial the experiment uh, i mean sorry it's not a bell curve right so it's going to measure spread but it's not going to give us something that's going to tend towards the bell curve what we want in essence is something like the 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 standard deviation as though we took all possible combinations of sample size 250 of the 40,000, which we're not gonna actually do, but is represented by this formula, right? So, we, so then we're gonna, that, that's, gonna be rep, that's gonna be represented by the formulas over here, boom, for the binomial one. All right, so, so that, that's gonna be the standard deviation for our formula. So how is this calculated? It's gonna be over here, just this bit. So we got the square root of P, times one minus P over N. So that's all that is doing is saying we're taking the whole thing is under the square root. And then P is of course our uh, 70.8. And then one minus P is just minus, is, is gonna be times the one minus P, which is the other bit, 29.2 uh, divided by N. And N is the 250, all of that is in the square root uh, function. So there, that is how you do it in Excel. So the margin of error that we can calculate then is going to be margin of error. And we wanted, we wanted two standard deviations. So we're going to say if this is the standard deviations, 0 0.02876, we wanted two standard deviations that was given in our, our data here, plus or minus, that's going to be the range we're looking for, which means that if it was a bell-shaped curve, we'd have like 95%, you know, about in the middle. So it's gonna be that times uh, two. So that's gonna be our 0 0.05752. That's the amount that we're gonna add and subtract to each side of the middle point, which is going to be the mean, which is that 70.8, which is right here and here. So now we're gonna say, let's look at our upper bit. So now we're imagining here, if we look at our graph, we've got like the middle bit, we know what the middle part is, and now we're making a range around it from that middle bit using our uh, margin of error calculation, which is representing two standard deviations away. So if I take the middle point, which I'll represent as a decimal 0 0.7080 uh, minus the, the margin of error, 
0.05751. That's going to give us then the what well, this is the upper bit. So the lower bit is 0 0.65. The upper bit is the middle point again, which is the 0 0.7080. That's right here. Plus the margin of error 0 0.05751. That's going to give us about the 77. It's rounded up with the five there. So that's going to be our range. So these two are the outer points we can imagine of the orange bit and the middle bit is of course the average or mean of 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 the of this information so how much is going to be in the middle then how much is under the curve in the middle if we took two standard deviations on the upper and lower well if it's a bell-shaped curve you would expect around the 95 percent how do we calculate that in excel we use the norm.dist so it looks crazy long, but that's because the norm.dist is just simply measuring always from left to right. So we have to take this bit up here, which is measuring the area up to here, but it's including this bit and we want to subtract that out. So we say the norm that everything up to here minus everything from this blue bit, and that will give us the middle part. So we just take the norm.dist of the x. So we're gonna take the upper x, which is gonna be this one, and then the mean, which is going to be this one, and then the standard deviation, which is gonna be the standard error, because that's the one that tends towards the bell curve. And then is it cumulative? This time, yes, it is cumulative. Therefore, a one minus the norm.dist of the same thing, except for x being the, low, the uh, lower x, the mean, is the same the standard deviation is the same standard error and it's also cumulative that gives us the 95 about percent 95.45 under the curve all right so then if we wanted to plot this graph out if we want to make this graph then i don't just want the two standard deviations away i'm going to go four standard deviations away so that I can have enough room to plot the graph. That's how I'm gonna think about how wide it needs to be. And I always wanna kinda of point this out because plotting these graphs is quite useful. Uh, and, and, and I can't really draw things out. That was a real <laughs> handicap to me in math schools <laughs> in my handwriting. So Excel is really helpful, but Excel has its own problems that you have to be able to, to map the thing out you know, pretty, pro pretty precisely so that you can draw it there. <laughs> so that means we need to go four uh, standard deviations on the upper and lower is, is gonna be the idea. We went further because in Excel, the data is actually shuffling around because we let these random numbers shuffle around. So, so, so that's why it's a little bit wider than that. So some things will be a little bit different because of that. But the general idea would be uh, if I want to go four standard deviations, if the middle point is once again that 0 0.7080 is the middle point, or let's do it this way, four standard deviations. Standard deviation is 0 0.02876 times four is that, and then we're gonna add and subtract that to the middle point. So if I, if I subtract that from the middle point of 0 0.7080, which is like the mean average that's gonna be the 59.3 about, and if we do the same thing with the margin 0 0.05751 times four, and then add that to the middle point of 0 0.7080, uh, hold on a sec, que paso aquí ahora. We're gonna say, let's do that again. We're gonna say 0 0.02876, this number times four plus, and then this number the uh, middle point, 0 0.7080, and that gives us the 82.3. All right, Mui, B to the N. I've got two letters for you. B, N, B, N. Why settle for just like a hippie, just being, man, when you can Mui be in, when you can, okay. So, so now we have our Xs, so I'm gonna represent them as percents. Now, I, the lower one is 59, I started at 55, just because again, these will keep on changing in my actual Excel worksheet. So I made it a little bit wider. And then, and then we're gonna do the norm.dist for each of these Xs. 
So it's just simply going to be the norm.dist of x, which is that, and then the mean, which is the next argument, which is the middle point over here. Uh, the mean is the middle point right there. And then we've got the standard deviation, which is the standard error, boom, right there. And then we've got then is it cumulative? No. Now, if you left it there and didn't do this 100 thing, it's still fine. You could still graph it, but the whole area of all the thing doesn't add up to 100, which I don't want to get into in detail now, but if you wanted the whole thing to add up to 100, I can take that whole thing and divide it by 100 so that the sum of all these actually add up to 100. All right, and then we can take the z-score, which, which means that, remember that down here, I can measure this in terms of x's, and I can measure it in terms of z's. Now, also remember that thing where it adds up to something other than 100 basically always happens with these binomial things because we're dealing with like these percentages uh so that so but in any case then we could do it by z-score now the z-score is simply calculated by doing this that's not the z-score we're doing this we're doing the 0.55 every point minus the middle point uh which is the mean which is 0.7080 and then dividing by the standard deviation or standard error 0.02876 and that gives us how far away we are in z's so now i can all i've done is convert the x's to z's in terms of standard deviations away from the middle point and then over here where i'm going to go two standard deviations away to two z's away on the negative and positive because that's going to be what the middle part is so you, you'll recall that what we want to see here is the middle point the average on the graph which is going to be the 70 point eight and then we want to see two standard deviations up and down the range around it which we can measure in standard deviations here or we can also measure it in the x's which we determined by this range here the upper and lower lower 0.65 upper 0.77 so this 0.65 it just should be around 0.6 it's a little wonky because it it's but you get the idea it should be right there that's the idea now, of course, to graph this in Excel, it's a little tricky, right? You can, you have, all I'm doing is selecting this column, graphing it with an area graph, although you could use a bar graph or a line graph. And then I'd like to add the X's and the Z's down below, which means you'd need two sets of data. So that's why I added this set of data, which is the middle point. So if logic test, I have an and, which says that if this number is greater than negative two and that's what the comma is, this number is less than positive two, closing up the and function for those two logic texts, then I want you to give me this number. If not, then quotes, just give me a blank. That's how you do it, computer code or whatever to give just a blank or text field you put, right? So, that, so then I only have these bits in the middle, that's the orange bit. So now I've got the orange bit now that I have two things I can I can label x axes on, then you can go back in there and say, now I want a second x axis for this orange one, which is going to be these z's. And that's how we can kind of overlap these two items and have these two uh, axes in Excel. So if you want to see more detail in Excel, it takes longer for us to map it out uh, in Excel. But uh, but you can but we'll we go over that in, in, in another course or section if you want to check that in more detail so that's pretty good you know we're doing okay on our movie production uh addressing the critics uh but i th i really think that we could we can destroy a few more of them uh um a little bit faster we need to we, that's where we need to put our money people i don't know i like i, I like we got to stop throwing our money away at like paying people to write scripts and whatnot and and really this is where our focus should be we should be crushing these people until they until they watch our movie out of fear so let's get on it let's get on it